Okay, so thank you, Tom, uh, for taking the time again to answer some of these very good and, and very important questions. My pleasure. Um, we've got a very topical question to start off with yeah. um, around the lockdown. Um, so there was quite a few came in around this, but one particular from Kelly. I'm concerned that after this break due to COVID-19, we are going to have some very anxious and sad children, particularly those who come from an unstable home. How are we going to settle them back in whilst maintaining consistency and clear rules? You know, that is, I mean, that's such a relevant question and it's so happens. I've been asked that a lot recently and I've been working with the DfE on some responses on exactly this. Um, I think, weirdly enough, I think the answer to that question lies in the question itself, if that doesn't sound too cryptic, which is that um, we mustn't assume, we, we, we mustn't start off with a deficit model and assume that children have been massively traumatised by lockdown uh, or, or by their own circumstances, nor should we assume they've had a perfectly happy time about it either. You know, children will, will have had very, very different times in lockdown. I mean, some children will have really enjoyed the chance to be with their family or avoid or skipping a bit of school, and some children won't have. Some children will have spent a lot of time in abusive and, 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 and difficult and traumatic and dislocated and very fractured circumstances, uh, and some children won't have. And what I often find is that Children frequently see the school as a bit of an arc if the school is doing its job properly, which is to say the children from the least structured backgrounds frequently need or cleave to or desire more structure, and that can often be provided by an institutional setting led and run by adults who provide those structure, that structure and those boundaries, but also do so with compassion and make the children feel like they're welcomed, they're needed, they're wanted. If you can remember that little trick at the end, then children can actually find school to be uh, a place of normality and security and routine. Uh, and, and boundaries aren't seen as threatening or, or oppressive. They're seen as, as being kind of welcome. Because children love to know where they stand and what they should be doing. And often, don't get me wrong, it's practically in their job description to push against these boundaries. And, and, you know, and that's to be understood and welcome to some extent. But I think school can actually be welcoming places. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll give a personal example, and I know that anecdote isn't data, but I'll just use this as an example. You know, I'm, I'm very fortunate. My wee boy, who went back yesterday, was who had a nice time at home. <laughs> I hope he wasn't having a difficult time. You know, we, we taught him as much as we could, and we played with him as much as we could, but he was dying to go back. And when we said to him yesterday, did you have a nice time? He said he couldn't wait to go back the next day. Now, obviously, that's one example. But I think that that illustrates nicely what school can be for children from those types of circumstances. So what teachers need to do and what schools need to do um, is to let the children know that they're welcome back, that the school is doing everything they can to keep them safe and to address those aspects of, you know, the famous Maslow's hierarchy of needs in terms of, you know, safety and security. Uh, and, and also remind the children of the great things that school is there for them and, and why they're at school in the first place and all the great things they can do and all the great things they can learn. But primarily reassure children that they're wanted, that you know, you're happy to see them, that it's great that they're back. Children need adult, and sorry if this answer is going on a wee bit long, maybe we'll be here for about five hours, I don't know. But children um, need grown-ups to be grown-ups. What they don't need to see from us right now are high levels of anxiety. They need to see us looking confident and assured so that we can be confident and reassuring to them. And I don't mean that in a glib synthetic way. I'm not saying we pretend nothing's wrong. In fact, far from it. We address the new normal. We address the new circumstances. But we say to the kids, and this is what we're doing to make it safer. And then kids will start thinking, oh, well, at least the grown-ups are, are, are doing something about this. But if the grown-ups say things like, you know, this is a really dangerous situation and, you know, we're all worried too, then the children will just feed off that anxiety and, and feel 10 times worse about it. So, to try to reiterate, re-establish your boundaries, re-establish your routines and norms, re-teach those old norms, and make that one of the biggest priorities you can have. So welcome the children back, but don't just say, and here are five rules you have to follow. Really go back over the basics. This is how we all get along with each other. This is how we keep each other safe. This is why we're doing it. It's because we value you. We want you to do well and use that framing device. And then in addition to that, then talk thoroughly about the new normal in terms of any kind of annex behavioral routines. So for example, 
teaching children about respiratory etiquette, teaching children about tactile etiquette, spatial awareness and spatial etiquette. You know, these are definitely three, three areas which must be really consciously tackled. Lots of teachers and schools will spend a lot of time working out how to set out their classrooms and their layouts and their playgrounds and, and red ropes and chains and arrows and, and, and two-meter spacings and so on. But never forget the most vital aspect of this, of any behavioral system, is teaching the children to do these things rather than just telling them. And I go over this point over and over again. You've got to teach children good behavior, not just tell them good behavior. Because if you tell them, it'll go over their heads. If you teach them, it becomes a habit. So that was a long answer for a short question. But I, but I mean, maybe we'll come back to that because if I'm honest, this is something which is really um, on a lot of people's minds right now. Yeah, thanks, Simon. I think the key the key point that I uh, go for that was the reassurance element. When mm. when they're back in, we we really need to reassure them because they will, they, you know, they'll sniff out any anxiety or fear that we have, yeah. and, that, and that just breeds it to them, which can then you know generate um, more poorly behaved you know poorly behaved children, which which is what we don't want. So yeah, thank you for that one, and we might come back to it. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, like sure, 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 sure. The next question is around building positive relationships with mm. students, and again, there was. Um, many questions come in from Wendy, Vicky, etc. But we've got one from Annette. Um, mm -hmm. How do I gain respect from the more disruptive students, even though they respect the male teachers more? Um, how can I keep them on track if they hate the subject? Yeah, this is. I mean, it's funny. I've been asked this question many times over the years. There, there, I mean, there's two things going on there. So you've got students who are disruptive for some teachers, but not others. And you strongly suspect there might be a, a sex or a gender-based element in terms of how they discriminate in those different environments. Or you've got students who are very switched on for some subjects but not others because perhaps they enjoy it, they can see themselves in it and so on. There are two problems. They're very related, but they are two separate problems. Um, when it comes to you know the suspicion of misogyny and this also maps out in terms of things like racism and accents and all the rest of it um this it's a really tricky and interesting one because one of the things first of all be very careful that you're not making assumptions that um the students are or aren't behaving because of the gender or the sex of the other teachers or yourself and um, it may be that that's something that you're noticing that maybe the children aren't noticing that's just that's just a, a one possible frame to throw out there. The second thing is, if you do if you do notice that the children are explicitly badly behaved for one sex or gender but not another, or if the children have communicated that in some way, you know, sometimes children can be quite unsubtle, and they'll say something like, you know, I don't I don't listen to women or something like that. Then obviously that's part of a bigger problem because no ch no child invents that kind of thinking for themselves, right? They get that from somewhere. Children don't invent themselves. Um, they, you know that, that that's very much an, a very adult activity to, to do so, and they've picked that up from home. A couple of things you can do. First of all, you might want to have a more pastoral approach to to what's going on. So you might want to have a an external to the classroom conversation about, you know, how they see men and women and why they do or don't think they should listen to one man or woman. And that can that should be done hopefully in a fairly neutral, non-threatening way so the children can start to unpack and unpick it. Because you never know, maybe the children don't aren't aware of the fact that they're expressing some kind of misogyny. Um, it might just be something they need to be brought to their attention. Look, I notice you're very good with sub and not with miss. You know, why is that? Oh, I didn't realise. You know, maybe, who knows? I'm trying to be optimistic here. Um, it might be more ingrained. It might be habitual. It might be, for instance, that... A child has come from a home where men are or aren't respected or women are or aren't respected and they've, they've picked up that habit and they're brought into school. The answer to this tends to be, I mean, it's, it's kind of simple and complex. And by that I mean that the children need to learn better habits. And it's very hard to change somebody's values. It can be done, but it's hard. It's a long-term project. It's easier to tackle somebody's behaviour. So... To some extent, whether or not it's emerging from misogyny or some other aspect or angle, one of the fastest and quickest things you can do is, is to say, I don't want to see this type of behaviour. Or better still, this is the type of behaviour I want to see. And I keep returning back to this. You've got to teach children good behaviour rather than simply reprimanding bad behaviour. Or if I can be more clear, you need to do both. Um, because if you can illustrate to children, this is what I want you to do in my classroom. This is what you're not doing, but this is what I'd like you to do. And I'll be really delighted if you can. Then that usually helps to set some children back on course. 
for children though who know what they should be doing but don't do it because they don't want to do it that's when you tend to need either more pastoral approaches outside of the classroom i.e long-term chats and conversations and so on sometimes even therapeutic approaches but but, but what we probably will need is a highly consistent level of some kind of consequence code i.e you walked up my lesson you were rude to me you didn't finish your work i need to see the end of the day i'm going to speak to your parents and so on and because if you keep it simple like that to some extent then whether it's coming from misogyny or laziness or maliciousness or even carelessness you tackle the behaviors first of all and then start to try and unpick the attitudes behind that because those attitudes are going to take a long time to change if a child genuinely thinks that a woman isn't worth listening to <laughs> you know i mean that's a long-term fix that's going to require conversations over several months probably with a pastoral leader, possibly with a mentor or a coach, sometimes even therapy if it's, if it's uh, ingrained enough. If it's a subject-based thing, i tell you what's quite interesting, is that very frequently children um, misbehave in subjects they find hard. Now, that's not a universal law because there's plenty of children who don't tell teachers to stick their lessons up their backsides just because they don't enjoy the lesson. I mean, I, I didn't enjoy PE uh, <laughs> because my teachers were brutes. But but they were some of them were lovely, so I take that back. So I know this is recorded. Um, but you know, but I tried and I didn't misbehave because of it. So it's not a universal law. Having said that, if you've got a child and they find a subject difficult, and that might just be a teaching issue, it might have just been because they weren't taught how to blend phonemes or number bonds or something incredibly basic in their literacy or their numeracy, then they're going to find subsequent work very very hard to access. So, you know, imagine a child in year nine who's got a functional reading age of four being asked to read Othello. You know, it's, you know, you can see big problems. And frequently children, rather than feel humiliated and embarrassed by this or persist with something they find unpleasant, they'll very frequently turn to misbehaviour or what, what they think is just behaviour. <laughs> they, they call it behaviour, we call it misbehaviour. It's just their response to an unpleasant circumstance. And so very frequently they'll leave a lesson, they'll tell you to get stuffed or they'll muck about on their phones or they'll chat to their mates rather than do the thing that they find difficult or hard. So if it's a subject issue, what I tend to find better is if, if you've got any time at all is to try to go back to a more basic level with the kids in terms of their learning. Because once a child gets to feel success in learning, gets to feel like they can do a subject, they start to enjoy it a little bit more. Now for some kids that's a long haul, for some kids that's a big, big journey. You know, as I say, if you've got a kid in year nine who can't read it's a hell of a journey to go back to Biff and Chip books, you know, <laughs> and common phonemes and so on. But that's what needs to happen. It might not be the teacher that does that. It might, you know, for something that extreme, it might have to be some kind of remedial small group pastoral circumstance outside of the classroom. You know, I'd, I'd be getting my Senko involved there rather than just saying, right, let's do some detentions. But for most children, it's, it's normally not quite that advanced. And it's not normally, let's go back to basics a little bit more. W where have you stopped understanding? Let the kid know that what they do matters and that doing well matters to you, but you will help them to do it. So again, two, two longer answers for a short question. I hope that to some extent addressed some of those issues. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think that on the second point, um, that was something I often tried to get across to staff is, Mm. The mis misbehaviour um, often comes out of the fact that the children are finding it difficult. Yeah, yeah. They're missing something out, and therefore, it's 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 a response, isn't it? It's a response. I can't do this, so I'm going to do something else. Um, mm. which, which, as you said, we see as misbehaviour, but to them, they just that's what they've got to do because the. the so it's yeah, all always yeah. about is the behaviour something that we can um, put right be, by supporting the student more rather than the going down the sanctioning route. Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, sure. I agree, agree on that point uh, wholeheartedly. Okay, um, the the next question um, is around communicating the strategies mm -hmm. with students with uh, specific needs or less able, and there's a particular one from Loretta um, that says, any advice on how to introduce, uh, introduce these behaviour strategies with EAL pupils who may also have some special educational need? Yeah, um, it's a quite a short question there. I, I was looking at it earlier on, and there's different ways I can interpret this, so I'll do my best. And, you know, and, and Loretta, I hope that it's as it's, it's useful to you. Um, for a start, with, with a student who's EEL, obviously a lot depends on the, the, the profoundness of, 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 of the, the, or rather the, the insecurity of the, of the existing English. Um, 
I would I always suggest to schools, whether children have EAL or not, the behavior management and 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 learning the behavior that's required, good behavior, is core. It's fundamental to the teacher project. It's not some kind of bolt on. One of the problems that many teachers face is because there's frequently not a lot of training in behavior management in schools or in teacher training. And I think it's a it's a global problem that we don't do a lot of training for teachers in this. I mean, it happens. It's you know, it's it's kind of patchy. Is that teachers frequently think, oh, I don't know how to manage behavior, so they so they don't think that there is an art or a skill or a science of behavior management. So what they tend to then do is they default to a very reactive mechanism, which is to say, I'll just try and teach my subject, and if they misbehave, I'll do something about it. You know, I'll react and respond. And one of the things I've seen the most effective classrooms and schools do worldwide is to t- keep going back to is to teach good behavior is to say this is what will this is what you need to do in my classroom i'll teach you how to do it and you really need to go back to basics and think well what does that involve what is it what is it i need them to do in order to succeed that they may be not doing that they might not be doing a lot in their own lives normally so whether it's primary or secondary you know getting a child to queue up getting a child to wait their turn to ask a question getting a child to hand in homework in time getting a child to know how to format their exercise book. Nobody's born knowing this. And if we assume that children know how to do it, then you know we're asking for trouble. We're basically asking for them to get it wrong. So you go back to these little micro behaviors of this is what I want you to do when you come to a lesson. This is what I want you to do when we transition between activities. This is how I want you to conduct yourself during a break or in the assembly hall or in the dining hall. And then teach those micro behaviors. And some people think, oh, that's absurdly obvious. You know, why, why do I need to go back to these tiny behaviors? It's not obvious because kids get it wrong all the time. So make it easier for them to behave and give them a fighting chance to behave by teaching them. So to get back to the question, the preamble, the preamble is relevant, I assure you. Um, it's probably far more important for children in those types of circumstances to be as carefully and patiently taught these good behaviors rather than anyone else you'll get children from very fortunate circumstances who've got you know high levels of cultural privilege and literacy and numeracy and lots of social advantages and they, they'll probably be okay they probably know what you expect of them they'll probably be able to sense it and, and find their way through then you get children from difficult circumstances or you know, may have had a poor experience in a previous school or whatever they don't know how to behave and if a child's come from a different country they might have very different expectations about how to behave in, in, in a school environment. If a child's come from a, a war zone, um, or, you know, I remember working with some teachers from Burkina Faso in Africa, and the children there had to walk for four hours to get to school. <laughs> and when they got to school, there was, you know, there wasn't a door on the, on the walls. You know, it was a completely different environment. So you've got to teach the expectations for the here and now. So I would suggest that depending on the, the, the profoundness of the 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 um the insecurity of their English, make sure that somebody somehow translates this. You know, either through translation or through careful exp- slow explanation in in simple English, or through pictorial means. That this is what I want you to do, and I bet you those kids will will be very grateful for it and think, thank God for that. Somebody took the time to explain this to me. I was once in a school where there was a student who just come from Spain. And she, and fortunately, she had you know she had kind of fifty percent English, so she could get by. And I spoke to her after she'd been in my class for six weeks, and I said, "Oh, you know, what lesson have you got next?" And she says, "I don't know." I said, "Show me your timetable." She said, "Nobody's given me a timetable." She had just been absorbed into the system and forgotten. I mean, it was that bad. So, you know, the children like that normally are super grateful for lots of support and boundaries and nurture, so that they feel uh, like that like they can perform to the required ability. And if a kid has got um, a special educational need, then the way in which the behaviour expectations are addressed to that child needs to be needs to accommodate those special educational needs. It might it might be that special education need needs no behavioural accommodations. You know, if a child is if a child, for instance, is deaf or something like that, then then the, the accommodations are normally more practical rather than behavioural, as, as it were. You know, the, the, it would be absurd and offensive to assume a deaf child would, wouldn't know how to behave. Um, if a child has got Tourette's syndrome, for example, which is, of course, a, you know, a neurological um, uh, circumstance and, and not the child's uh, uh, fault in, in any way, then what you would do with that kind of circumstances, you would say, right, we, we know you're going to swear or have uncontrollable uh, physical or verbal tics. Uh, this is what we'll do when it happens. 
and set up that expectation in advance so the kid knows not to feel constantly blamed or in trouble because of it. And crucially, have a chat with the rest of the class and say, hi, this is, you know, Tom. He's got Tourette's syndrome. Let's talk about what Tourette's syndrome is. So this is what's going to happen. If he does swear, he's not going to be sent out. And this is why. But that doesn't apply to you because you don't have Tourette's syndrome. And most kids are like, fine, okay. So consider the individual child's needs, but also consider the classroom needs. And if you can do lots of preemptive foreshadowing of what's going to happen if and when, that's usually of huge benefit to not just the individual child, but to the whole class. Lovely, thanks, Tom. Um, and I hope that answered your question, Loretta. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Um, the next question is around responding to poor uh, group mm -hmm. behaviour. Um, and one in particular from Alexandra. Um, how do you approach behaviour management in class where you seem to be getting issues from every direction at yeah. once and then feel completely overwhelmed? Yeah, Paul. I mean, I, 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 I feel Alexandra's pain here. This, this is so common. This is so common. And here's the interesting thing, that in a class of 25 or 30 kids, it doesn't take much from several kids for all of a sudden for the class to feel like a riot. You know, for a class to feel utterly chaotic. If you've got six or seven kids involved in low-level chatting, um, it feels like you're teaching in the middle of Oxford Circus. You know, it's it's not it's not pleasant. Um, a couple of things to remember, and this is particularly for the newer teacher, I feel, which is that um, it's probably not everyone, right? And when we see things going wrong, I think human beings are hypersensitive, and, and, and rightly so, we're hypersensitive to things going wrong. We, we, you know, we look to see dangers and threats. I think it's an evolved trait, he says with his anthropologist hat on, that, I mean, it's why the newspapers are full of bad news. Nobody turns on the newspaper, nobody turns on the news to see, you know, all the great things that happened today. It's mostly, you know, things that went wrong or things that broke. Um, and as a teacher, particularly if you're a newer teacher, you can often look at a class and go, look at all this stuff going wrong. The first thing I suggest is this, recalibrate your vision. Look at all the things that are going right. Look how many kids are actually doing what you ask them to do. And it's probably more than the other the other ones. Probably. I mean, it might not be, but it usually is. And you usually find that in even what you would call a bad lesson, most kids do what you ask them most of the time. Right? That's, that's the first thing. And that's more just an attitudinal thing so that you don't feel that you're rubbish or that you're, or that you're constantly swamped. That's more just a kind of a, a, a lens to which you see things. The second thing you need to do, is if that's the types of behaviour you're getting, then I would suggest you do a wee bit of a classroom reboot, which is to say you clarify to these 25 children, this is what you're expecting to see. So at the beginning of your next lesson, you take a deep breath and you say, right, don't, get, don't open your books yet. Everyone eyes on me. Everyone eyes on me. Say it like you mean it. And if you, and if you need to, and if it's that bad, if you need to, get somebody senior or a line manager to come and support you with this. If it's that bad, because I know a lot of people find finding silence quite difficult. It's a, it's a separate art in itself. And then what you say to the kids is something along these lines. Listen, some of the work so far has been brilliant. I'm really proud of a lot of you for a lot of what you've done. Some of the behaviour has been really, really good. Um, and I've really enjoyed working with this class. You've got you've got to layer that on thick. If, you, know, you can't make the kids think, I hate you. This is all going wrong. But what they need to hear then is this. Some of the behaviour hasn't been good enough, and because of that, it's making some of the it's making some of the learning really hard to do, and it's also making some of the teaching really hard to do. And I can't have that because I want you all to do as well as you possibly can. And you know, you got to say it like it's dead serious, like it means a lot to you, but not that you're upset or anxious. Just this needs to happen. It's got to be delivered with a very assertive tone. So, in order for you all to flourish and succeed, which is what I want. Here's what's going to have to happen from now on. And then you lay your stall out once more. What I frequently find with particularly newer teachers, but sometimes more experienced teachers, is that we assume that they're going to behave. And then we respond when they don't. And what needs to happen is loads of this proactive stuff, this teaching of behaviour. Here's what I want you to do. Here's what success looks like. Here's why we're going to do this. Because, you, you know, you know here's, how we, here's why we have a hands-up rule. Or not, as the case may be, because I want to hear from everyone, including the quiet people, because you've all got great ideas in your heads, and I refuse to let one person's voice be drowned out. You know, language like that can really reach children, and they go, oh, that sounds really good. And very rarely the children go, nah, stuff, I don't, I don't, I'm not having this. I'm not having this being listened to rubbish. You know, most kids can go, oh, I don't know if that makes sense. 
So you lay your stall out again, and then from that moment onwards, you stick to it. And if anyone challenges your boundaries, you've got to call them out on it. Not in an exasperated, shattered way, but in a kind of a, right, I need to see you afterwards, or right, that's a C1, or right, what did we say earlier on, or right, your name's on the, your rainbow name's been taken down the rainbow a wee peg or two, or something along those lines. Other approaches I could suggest for this, because there's loads of things you need to do, is if, if loads of people are misbehaving, for God's sake, don't issue some kind of whole classroom sanction. For God's sake, never do that. You'll lose all the kid children who have who are you know, with you. As, as Eminem once said, take names in the morning and kick ass in the evening. And I mean, I mean that in a positive way. You know, write down the names of people that you know were doing things that you'd ask them not to do, and only ask to see them later on. But for God's sake, don't just kind of scatter gun and say, "I need to see everybody back afterwards," because you're it'll drive them nuts and you'll only get half the class and what do you do then you know and and if somebody says why are you picking on me they were talking to what you then say to that kid is oh we'd like to go on record and say that can I have a statement to say that and most kids will go no well, fine let's deal with your behavior right now then because i'm looking at you you know and that usually kind of puts their gas somewhat at a peep to some extent but the key thing is is to try and sift out the noise from what's important really Really aim for consequences for the children who've misbehaved the most. You know, go for go for the head of the beast, as it were. D don't try and pick up everything then, because you just don't have the capacity to do so. Pick up in the big ticket things. Pick up in the ringleaders. Pick up in the people who were really noisy and encouraged other people to misbehave. The people that pushed the table over. The people that told somebody to f off. Pick up on that. Do your phone calls home. Do your recording. Do your systems. Do your consequences. Have your reboot the next lesson. If necessary, have a few children parked in a different lesson for the next lesson as a consequence of their behaviour or something like that. I don't, you know, or have them parked with a pastoral leader or have whatever consequence the school recommends. But make sure the kids realise that that wasn't good enough, but you want them to be better. It's, it's a long, slow slog with some children, but persistence and consistency is your ally here. You've got to be more persistent than them. You will get them eventually. What they want to see is you flaking out and freaking out. What they want to see as small pieces of you falling off you as the day progresses, don't give it to them. Let them see that you care so much about their education and learning that you're not going to break. That's what I suggest. Brilliant, thanks, Tom. If I could pick you on, on a couple of things. In terms of the, the reboot, um, which yeah. I think yeah, is a really great idea, um, and you know, it's getting back on a level with them, isn't it? And so they understand, make an understanding of what the expectations mm. are. And um, what I found was um, s sometimes my staff um, would do that far too often, so it became a, it became a, um, oh, he's he's doing this again. Yeah. Um, so, so what sort of advice would you have around the amount of times you do that? Mm. In, um, yeah, sure. And <laughs> um, when it comes to rebooting your behaviour expectations, the, there's two ways to. I should put this. If you've laid out your behavioural expectations clearly, if you've set your standards, if you've really taught to the children what you want them to do, and that can sometimes involve physically practising it, like lining up or handing books out or taking your desk or whatever. You know, I mean, never feel, never be afraid of saying to kids, let's practise that one more time. I wasn't quite happy with that. Uh, it's often a confidence game. You know, a lot of teachers often to go, oh, I couldn't, I, I couldn't ask them that. Well, if you've decided that yourself, then you're right, you can't. But if you just say to yourself, no, I need you to do that again. Thank you, that's much better. Good, well, let's, let's try that again in the future. So if, if, you're, if you're assured that you've taught them the behaviour properly and it's still not get great and you're still working on your consequences, there's two ways to maintain your standards. One is you have a, a kind of a, a soft perpetual reboot, which is to say you're always mentioning the standards you expect. So you've got to talk about it a lot. You've got to demonstrate it a lot. You've got to challenge it all the time. You've got to congratulate people for meeting the standards. You've got to really point at it and pinpoint it and say, that was brilliant. Did you see how he waited his turn there? Good hands up, Jasmine. You know, little things like that all the time, drip, 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 so that they know that that's the normal in that classroom. Because once something feels like a norm, they're more likely to, be, to gravitate towards it. So there's that. And that is, needs to be like 80% of your behavior management constantly mentioning what you expect don't just tell them once and hope they'll remember it for the rest of their lives it's a wee bit like you know me trying to teach somebody how to drive by showing them once and saying right now you can do it can't you or worse telling them once and saying right now you can do it it's something that requires practice behavior is 
Behaviour is habitual, habitual, which is physical, and it's attitudinal, which is mental. And that takes time to bed in. It takes time to get used to. Like like a golf, like a golf swing. That was my golf swing. You can tell how good at golf I was. Um, it's, it's it's a practice thing. But the second thing is the hard reboot, which which we've kind of mentioned just there, which is that you know the more formal. Right, everyone look at me. Let's really clearly and closely discuss the rules. Um, I'm going to be honest. I'm not saying it can't be done too much. It probably could be done too much. But if you have to do it, you know, once every less and say, right, everyone eyes on me, pens down. What's not happening here? You you will wear them down eventually. I mean, all but the most psychopathic of children, and I mean that sincerely, I mean, I use that word carefully, will eventually kind of go, right, they're not going to give up. It's the sense of, am I doing this too much? It tends to defeat lots of teachers because they think to themselves, well, maybe I am, so I won't mention it now. And when they stop mentioning it, the kids start thinking that it's not important anymore. Or worse, the teacher, teacher stops challenging students when they don't do it. So if you've, if you've made a really big point that when kids come in the classroom, they've got to take their desks and start their work, and people are mucking about. Or if you've made a really big point about you know fast transitions between activities, and it still hasn't happened. And by all means, you know, once a lesson or once every couple of lessons, say, right, everyone, pens down, shut your books, eyes on me, what's not happening here, what needs to happen, why is it supposed to happen? Right, let's practice that one more time. You know, I, I promise you 95, 99% of kids will kind of go, enough, enough, we give in. But if we give in, first of all, then, then you know, they, they tend to take the high ground there. Yeah, so relentless follow through, isn't it? Relentless, yeah. yeah. I know it, it sounds tiresome. It is bloody tiresome, but it's it's important. Okay, we're going to move on to the next question, which follows on um, around disruptive students, um, yeah. and one particularly from Katrina. Um, mm -hmm. If a child is being extremely disruptive, uh, and I've used the scripted strategy mm -hmm. where I link back to the positive behaviour, yeah. to my expectations, and leave them to reflect. Uh, however, they then continue to be disruptive or refuse to listen. Mm. about what's being said um if i'm not allowed to use the reward system within the classroom and i'm discouraged from using slt to resolve the situation where where does katrina go yeah you know what i've heard this so many times um i think that slt and teachers are all fighting the good fight i think that the vast majority of people in their position are doing the best they can for the best for their students um, I don't like vilifying SLT, and I don't like dumping everything on classroom teachers. I th you know, there's 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 goodies and baddies and everything in between. I tell you, in my experience, and I've, I I must have worked now with thousands of teachers, classroom teachers. When I used to work on the TS Behaviour Online Forum, one of the most common complaints I got was, um, SLT have said to me, I've got to resolve this myself. I know where this is coming from. This normally comes from a very, very good place of, I want you to develop and build up the skills yourself to deal with these children interpersonally. And there is a time to say that. There is a time to say this, you know, this isn't for me to resolve, this is up to you to resolve. There is definitely a time for that. There's also a time for support and cushioning and scaffolding and structure, particularly when somebody is a novice. I mean, everything we know about learning in general suggests that novices learn different from experts. And novices frequently need a lot of hand-holding and, and direct instruction. So I'll, I'll end on that point. Um, secondly, there's an interesting point that Katrina made here in her question. She said, if a child is being extremely disruptive, and I've linked back to positive behaviour, I've explained my expectations, and I've left them to reflect, I'm going to suggest that if a child is extremely disruptive, then leaving them to reflect in a classroom is not the best option. That if they're being extremely disruptive, and obviously we, we're going to, we can argue or discuss what, what, we all mean by extremely disruptive. I would suggest that that child needs to be removed to some extent. And I don't just mean binned. I don't mean, you know, shot off into space. I mean taken somewhere where they can be looked after and supported in a pastoral way and they can discuss what they've done wrong or why they're, you know, whatever. You know, there, there should be a system in place, even if it's just parking. Although I much prefer a pastoral environment where they get taken, where they can have a conversation with somebody say, What's going on today? Why are you behaving like this? Do we need to go down a sanction route? Or is there something we can discuss? 
is there some promise you can make me about? You know what I mean? There's so many different ways you can respond to misbehavior. But the key thing is if somebody's been extremely disruptive, if they're being allowed to sit in class and reflect <laughs> on their behavior, I'm going to tell you this. I know kids. I know human nature. It's very hard to say to someone, you need to reflect on your behavior and for them to go, hmm, you're right. You're right. I was being, you know, terrible. I'm struggling to find the word there. It, that tends not to happen. If somebody's disrupting a lesson, for the good of other children in the lesson, I would suggest that, he be, those, that child needs to be somewhere else so the other children can see that their learning matters too and that boundaries matter. Because I guarantee you, if you treat one child like that in a lesson and allow them to remain, there's somebody else in the class thinking, oh, well, I can get away with it too. There might be a dozen kids thinking that. And there's certainly a lot of kids thinking, why isn't that person, why isn't that kid being removed from the lesson just now? This isn't fair. We can't learn. We've got to listen to him bark on about, you know, Grand Theft Auto or whatever. Or whatever. So I'm sure my age is there. Um, so that's one suggestion I would make, that, that, that in-class reflection is an insufficient response as a strategy to extreme disruption. Um, another thing I, I'm going to suggest is that Reward systems are very similar to sanction systems. I, I, I strongly believe in reward and sanction systems as part of your calorie-controlled diet, but, but they're only part of your system. And you cannot punish a child into behaving well. You also can't reward them into behaving well. You also can't talk them all into behaving well. You, we use a combination of all of these strategies, including restorative conversations, including passive, pastoral support, including therapy, including you know, getting the parents involved and so on. We use as many strategies as we can. We hit them with everything we can to modify their behavior and encourage them to do the right thing. And um, reward systems tend to have a moderate, low impact, um, a low, sorry, low impact on some children and not others. They impact some children more than others and some children the impact not at all and so on. some children the impact greatly. It's the same with sanctions. So when you say, I want to be allowed to use a reward system, reward systems tend to work best with children who are already behaving quite well, which is the bitter irony of the situation. If only it were not so. Um, I'm not saying don't have them. I, I think we do still have reward systems. But if you have like a whole class reward system or a, or a reward system for children to get a bike after a year, then it's mostly the well-behaved children are aiming for it. For children who are very disruptive, the rewards need to be incredibly tailored and personalised for it to have any impact whatsoever. So it needs to be something like, you know, Billy, if you can give me three good lessons, then I'll take you off report and I'll send a postcard home to your mum or something like that, you know, something that other kids in the class might not get. You know, you wouldn't give a, a reward postcard to every child who has three good lessons because they're looking and think, well, that's, that's a pathetically low expectation. I'm always good in lessons. So you tailor it to the individual pupil. But the best type of reward you can use with a child, in my, in my opinion, and the one that really gets long-term impact is, is sincere, targeted, and proportionate praise uh, because it's aimed at the student. If you've got a child that comes in with a, a dirty collar, no pens every single day. Who knows why? Multiple reasons. And then one day they come in with a clean uniform and all their equipment. You walk up to that child so that nobody can hear you and you say, well done. Thanks for your uniform today. You look, you look great or something like that. And then you walk away. You don't make a fuss about it. You don't say that to the child who's always got three pens and a clean uniform because they'll think you're a mug. You target the praise to the child, which means you've got to know the child, which means you've got to know their baseline and you've got to know a wee bit about their background. Um, so rewards can go so far in a classroom. Um, with disruptive children, it needs to be something which is set personal to them. So the, the danger is, is that the disruptive child ends up getting drowned in reward merits for turning up or for having a pen. And the child next door who's always got a pen goes, where's my reward merits? I've got a pen every day. You know, and, 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 and they'd be right to say that. It becomes a very unfair system. So anyway, um, I would suggest that removal and some kind of consequence system, in addition to that, needs to be needs to be um, needs to be part of the situation. If SLT aren't allowing that, then they are becoming part of the problem. He says cautiously. I'll leave that there. 
Yeah, absolutely. And it, just I want to expand on a couple of the points around yeah. the, the impasse reflection, if, if I may. Um, I think where I've seen that occur as well, and I picked up on the exact same point as, as what you made, the student will then use that, ooh, if I'm a bit naughty, I'm going to get 15 minutes on my own in the corner. Absolutely. And, that, yeah. and that bad yeah. behaviour will, will, will continue. And then others see that as well, as you, as you mentioned. Well, he gets 15 minutes in the corner, but then they're a little bit naughty, and then they, 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 that continues. And, um, and take it from personal experience in terms of the removal of going from a system where we didn't have a removal system in my school and going to a removal system. Um, the, the appreciation of some of the students in those um, yeah. classrooms of, of having that um, child removed because they keep doing the same thing is 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 you know, fantastic. They see it and they're going, and, they, and they're open about it. That you can see that thank God he's gone type of thing, so they can get on. <laughs> no, no. So yeah. And can I just I, say, Paul, you can also, I mean, it's perfectly possible to remove a child with compassion. It's perfectly possible not to remove them because, oh my God, get them out. It's perfectly possible because you think this is the best place for them, this is the best thing. Because every child, you know, in the old phrase, every child matters. Every child's education matters. And if you're holding 25 kids' education hostage for one child, that's unfair on 25 kids too. And nobody's being served well here, least of all the disruptive student, and including a member of staff whose nerves might be shot by now by the attempt to try to teach an environment which is utterly hostile to learning. Yeah, absolutely. And it's sometimes unfair to leave that child also in that situation time and time again where they need that pastoral discussion. And, you know, they might just be having a really, really bad day and need yeah, to be yeah. able to talk about the pastoral thing. So, okay, thanks, Tom. And the next one's around non responsive students. Um, so, in particular, one from uh, Cassie. Mm. Um, if a child continues to disrupt and ignore your, ignores your efforts, obviously, while mm. you're staying calm and explaining expectations, um, how would you best proceed? Um, and and they've, they've put some suggestions there. By giving yeah. them from, by giving them a gentle warning first, um, and then a follow through. What, what's your thoughts, Tom, on that one? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I, behavior can be complex, and, and, and human nature is complex. And sometimes our responses to misbehavior needs to be very, very complex indeed. Having said that, <laughs> having said that, systems need to be as simple as possible. There's, there's, a, there's a great line from Get Shorty, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Elmer Leonard's great book and then film Get Shorty, where uh, Chili Palmer, played by John Travolta in the film, um, he says, I'm going to say as little as possible, if that. And that line always stuck with me <laughs> for, a, for a teacher. You know, your systems need to be as simple as possible, you know, if that. Um, or as complex as necessary. And if a child is disrupting and you've clearly taught them what the expectations are and you know that they're capable of beating those expectations, let's assume for a minute here that there's no neurological atypicality, there's no cognitive impairment, there's no um, extraordinary levels of, of, of trauma or, or something like that which is impinging upon their behaviour. Let's say the, the, the kid has some kind of volition, some kind of agency in the matter here. The child is disrupting. You've stayed calm because you don't want to give them a, a floor show. You've explained the expectations and they're still not doing it. You follow through on the school consequence system for the good of their, and it's kind of, this kind of links back to a previous question, for their good and for the good of the rest of the class. Now, if it's a warning, you give them a warning. Um, and try not to make the warning too perfunctory. Try to say, that's a warning. I really don't want you to have to go any further. I need. I want you in my classroom. You know, Try to remind the child you're not getting angry. You don't hate them. Because the minute the child starts to feel this is personal, the child will go, really, I'll show you misbehaviour. You know, so, don't, so don't make it easy for them to misbehave. Don't give them a reason. Say, listen, I really want you to stay here. Please don't make me remove you because that's the next thing I really don't want. I'd rather you stayed. And it's true. You know, de de deliver that with sincerity. And if the child then proceeds on to the next ladder, the rung of the ladder, you've got to follow up with that. And if it's removal or C2 or, or they've lost golden time or their face goes down the rainbow or whatever it is, you've got to follow up with it. The minute you don't follow up with it, the kids realise that the norm is something different from what you said. The norm is, I can get away with it. You know, it's, it's also why, I mean, I don't know if, I don't know if they're, they're talking about a secondary or a primary student here, um, in secondary schools where things like C1, C2, C3 type consequence codes are more are more common. I once went to a school that had C7 
And you had to go C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, and they were all warnings. And then C7 was move seat. <laughs> right? And C8 was five minutes off break. You know, it was madness. It was like... It was. I, I presume that C15 was, you know, brushed gently with a feather duster or something like that. It was, you know, it was nonsense. And the kids knew this. And the problem, I, I, and, and, you know, there's a, there's a kind of a melodramatic effect here being achieved, but many schools do something similar, which is they'll have lots and lots of warnings. I guarantee you this, for, for, for the vast majority of children who tend to misbehave on a more or less regular basis, a warning is nothing. You know, a warning is a snooze alarm. How many snoozes have I got? And you, we've all had, you know, we've also come to the snooze alarm fifteen times until eventually it's way past the time you should have got up in the first place. And um, a lot of schools I've worked with have done something quite useful. If they've got say you know three warnings and then a consequence, I've said to them, "How about you just cut away one of those warnings and see what happens?" And here's the weird thing: you don't get a sudden spike in misbehaviour, and in many circumstances you see a reduction in misbehaviour. Because the children, if you give children three warnings before a consequence, they'll very quickly think, I can do three naughty things <laughs> before anything's going to happen to me. And I promise you, I've seen children working it out, thinking, I've got one more, I've got one more warning, sir. <laughs> as, as if that's how it works. A war if anything, there should be one warning. If you're going to have a warning, have one warning. I've seen some schools quite profitably go down to no warnings. On the, I know that might sound a wee bit draconian, and it's on the grounds of, well, they know what they should be doing. They know they shouldn't be chucking pens at each other. So if they do it once, why should I warn them? I, I kind of get that. I kinda, it kind of makes sense. The warnings tend to be for children who are struggling with their behaviour and maybe just a wee nudge back in the table. Again, I'm okay with that too, but I certainly wouldn't fall into this pit of, uh, of you know, eternal recurring um, of, of warnings. There you go. Thanks, Tom. Uh, yeah, I would like to have seen that um, C7, C8, C9 uh, school and see how, how that worked. Um, it didn't have very, a problem. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> okay, moving on to uh, good behaviour and how we respond yeah. to it. Uh, you've alluded to some of this in a previous question. Um, yeah. It's from, from Siska. What, what is uh, the recommended frequency, daily, weekly, monthly, in, in terms of sending positive notes mm -hmm. home? Yeah, that's you know I, I was I was chewing upon that. It's not often I get asked a question I've never been asked before. I don't think I've been asked that before uh, in, in a long and illustrious career of I've been asked you know good and bad questions. And um, I'm tempted to say as often as you need to, because I'd be I'd be I'd be absolutely loath to try and set some kind of synthetic limit on this. I'd, I'll, t I'll a couple of points when it comes to praise. I mentioned earlier on that one of the best rewards is praise. And that for that praise to be effective, it's got to be sincere, targeted, and proportionate to the circumstance. Um, one of the dangers of not doing that is that it becomes gushing. Um, and when, and as with any, I don't know if you're any economics teachers out there, but you know when you flood a market with a commodity, the value of the commodity plummets. You know when something is, is when something is abundant. Everywhere, you know, it becomes less valuable. Um, and if praise becomes too abundant, people value it less. And you know, I'm old enough to remember the good old days of X Factor and, and Britain's Good Talent because I have nothing to do on a Saturday night. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's kind of a talent competition with judges. And, and the, the, there's a judge there called Simon Cowell who used to be famously quite mean. And then you got loads of other judges like Louis and David Williams. Who, who are essentially praise machines. Right? And, no, and here's the thing, nobody cares what they think. Nobody cares if they, they love you or you're a ready-made pop star. Nobody cares. But the people used to always quite care about the fact that Simon Cowell was very, very um, mean with his praise. And we all remember teachers at school who are very, um, you know, who treat praise as something quite, quite a valuable thing. They, they, they don't just give it away easily. So when you get it, it's worth something. Um, I once saw a supply teacher who was absolutely mocked mercilessly for a whole hour in a lesson at school. Um, and kids were awful to him. I mean, really, really awful. And when they left the lesson, he stood at the door and he nodded and said, thank you very much. Thank you very much for a wonderful lesson. Thank you very much for a wonderful lesson. And when I said to him, what just happened? <laughs> were we in the same lesson? He said, I want them to leave on a positive note. And I said, mate, they've, le they've left thinking that you're a complete monk. They've left thinking that you'll accept anything and you'll clap. 
you know, they need to know that they were disapproved of. There's a, there's a reason why we have these human emotions and responses. Um, so when it comes to positive notes home, um, when, when necessary, and I would try not to regiment it too much, but what I would do is to keep a note of who you're sending these notes to because it's very easy to fall into rewarding the same people. Try and see if there's someone who hasn't been rewarded, try and see who hasn't got a positive note. It would be, to be honest, I mean, without wishing to try to systematise this too much, it would be lovely if somebody got a note at least once a year home, like a letter or a postcard. There are some parents who get nothing but negative comments. If they get a postcard from you saying, listen, I know Billy's had a tough time this term, but he did a lesson today where he was totally switched on, he had all his equipment, he tried his best. I'm really grateful for that. Well done, Billy. You know, that mum might just glow with pride. You might be the only teacher in the school she's heard that from. But also don't forget the invisible kids. The kids are just, they never do anything exceptional in terms of exceptionally good or exceptionally bad, but they do their best and they bring all their kit in and, and they try and they turn up. Make sure those kids get a little reward once in a while. Again, target the praise for the behaviour and understand the context. Um, I mentioned earlier on that you wouldn't praise somebody for having a clean collar and three pens if they always did it. But what you might want to do is once every six months keep them behind with five other kids and say, you six, always turn up, always get equipment, great uniform, try your best, good answers, you know, nice support. You're all getting a postcard home. I really appreciate what you do in this class. Thank you very much. Dismissed. You know, that's all that's required sometimes. And it's, I, 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 and it's interesting how this is also important at a staff level too, that leaders and line managers, if you can just notice people occasionally, and if you're responsible for other people, then you have to super notice them a wee bit too. So as often as you want to, quite frankly, but not too often. Otherwise, yeah, it just becomes, oh, I've got another note home. You know, once every few weeks would probably be enough for a, for a positive note home, I, I would suspect. There you go. You, got, you finally got a time-based answer out of me. Thank you, Tom. Um, we're, we're going to move on, if, 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 um, if, you, if you don't mind, to question eight, which was about around student motivation. Um, and it, it links back to the, to the reward element you were talking about before. So it's from Lucy. How, how do we motivate children without reward? <laughs> Fear. No. Um, right. Human motivation is interesting. And, and I often come back to this when I'm talking about behaviour. Because... Getting people to do what you want them to do, especially when it's in their best interest, is very much the key business of what it, what we do as teachers and educators. It's you know it's very much what we what we're in the game for. And there's lots of children who do what we ask them to do just because we've asked them to do it, because they're already pre motivated to, for example, respect institutional authority, to value education, to do what a grown up asks them to do, to please the teacher, and so on. They're already pre motivated. They've got these motivations baked into their characters, their values, and their habits. There's plenty of children who don't come to school with that programming, with that type of stuff baked into them. And it's usually because they've been taught different habits, different beliefs, different values, and different attitudes from parental groups, community groups, home life, media, peer groups, and so on. So they might come in thinking that school's rubbish because their parents say that. They might come into school thinking that... Um, you know, adults are to be mistrusted or institutions are to be mistrusted. So they've got very different motivations baked into them. So if you want to try to think about motivation that way, rewards are one way of achieving motivation. And then this is very much the behaviourist model, whereby you attach something they like to a behaviour you want them to do. And it's exactly the same thinking behind attaching a sanction to something you don't want them to do. You know, you essentially, it's kind of like, it's conditioning and it's Pavlovian, and you want them to associate one with the other so that they, for instance, are deterred from doing one action or encouraged to do another. Right? That's the basic behaviourist model. So a lot of people criticise the behaviourist model. I, do, I don't think it's wrong. I just don't think it's the entirety of human motivation, but it is definitely part of human motivation. So you're entirely right, pardon me, you're entirely right to ask, do I always need to use rewards? Because the answer is no, you don't always need to use rewards. I would suggest, though, it would be very strange not to use rewards. I mean, why would you deliberately not use rewards when rewards can be part of your process? Mild rewards to create a short-term impact on some students ain't nothing. It's still something. But I keep coming back to this. The, 
the best reward you can use is sincere targeted proportionate praise because it cues right into what children feel about themselves. Now, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is, is a really interesting thing for most teachers to be aware of, and most teachers have probably seen this to some extent. It's, you know, it's the, it's the now familiar pyramid of things that tend to motivate us. And right at the bottom, you've got um, biological, you know, functional needs, things like air, oxygen, oxygen, water, and food, and so on. Um, and then above that, you've got the sense of security. And then above that, you've got things like esteem and belonging and, and, and self-value. And I think that that's a really interesting thing to focus in on because what do people really want? And often what people really want is to feel needed, to feel wanted, to feel valued and important, and to feel that what they're doing is meaningful. And I think almost everybody thinks this, apart from, as I alluded to earlier on, the sincerely psychopathic personality or the sociopathic personality profile who, you know, has got very deep issues with giving a damn about what anyone else thinks. Almost everybody else gives a damn quite a lot about what other people think, but not all people, not at all times, select peer groups and, and, and pressure groups. So if you want to motivate children, ask, what is it they want? They want to feel noticed and valued and important and special. So one of the ways we can do this as teachers is to, is to try to provide that to some extent in a way which isn't synthetic, but it's directed towards education. So we can tell them that we want them to be in the classroom, tell them we're looking forward to teaching them, tell them we love it when they do well, tell them that they can succeed, tell them that they matter to me. And that because of that, I'll do my absolute best to, to, to teach them and to help make them understand. And I know they're not all going to love the subject. That's not possible. I'm not an idiot. I used to teach RS for God's sake. You know, kids would say, I don't want to be a priest. And I would go, what? You don't want to be a priest? Are you kidding? I had no idea. Um, but I hope you might enjoy the subject. You might enjoy being good at it. You might, you'll certainly enjoy some of it. You know, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting. But then, you know, I think that's interesting and some people don't. You can't make somebody be interested, but you can make them enjoy the subject. So number one, Really think about your pedagogy. Use things like, um, you know, Rosenstein's principles of instruction. Think to, think to yourself, how am I communicating this? Use some kind of mastery model about, you know, about securing knowledge of the foundations before you move on to the next step and the next stage. Never move on to a more complicated topic until a child's understanding is secure in the foundations of that topic. And when you teach children like that, which sounds obvious, but, but it ain't obvious, that's when... Children start to enjoy the subject. They don't feel insecure about it. They don't feel like they're bad or stupid. And no matter what stage or level they're at, they want to do it because they want to get to that next level of enjoyment. In computer game design, this is called flow, which is a lovely concept. I came across it a few years ago. When you design a computer game, initially it's fairly easy. You know, you're doing the practice mode and you're walking about and jumping and shooting rockets and jumping over things and you go, this is quite fun. I'm just exploring the world. And eventually you get good at that. The challenge is low and, the, and there's a wee bit of reward for you there. But eventually you start getting bored because there's no challenge because it's so easy. So what does the, the game do? It gets harder. It gets harder. The challenge goes up. So you have to learn new skills. Look at me. This is me shaking a joystick, by the way, because I am 150 years old. right? <laughs> um, the challenge goes up. You get better at it. It gets boring, so it gets harder. And if you, and if you can draw that as a line, you know, challenge versus boredom, then you get, that's called flow. And you want to keep people on that flow until the end of the game. Learning is like that too. So that's one of the biggest motivators, teach them well. Another motivator is to try to make children feel included and noticed and important. So congratulate them when they do well and, and, and say to them, what, you know, what didn't you understand here? Let me help you with that. Don't embarrass them. Don't leave them behind. Um, don't make any child feel like a pariah or an outcast. If they let you down, let them know that you've let them down that they've let you down, but don't humiliate them. And when you speak to them after the lesson about their misbehaviour, say to them, I know you can do better than this. I want you in my lesson. I can't have you in my lesson if you keep doing this. So how are we going to achieve that? Hey, what, what can we do? And sell it like that. Um, particularly with children who come from more vulnerable or less structured backgrounds. So how you motivate children with a reward? I mean, it's such a short question, but it's, it goes off in so many different directions. Brilliant. Thank, thanks, Tom. Uh, great insight there. Great insight into in, in some of that. Um, we've got we've got two questions left, and the next one is around um, advice for NQTs, really. Yeah. Um, one from Hannah. I'm currently a primary PGCE student. 
soon to be going into my NQT year. I am used to explaining my expectations with the class I am working with at the beginning of my first lesson that I teach them. However, for some reason, I'm slightly worried about how I'm going to set my expectations with my mm -hmm. own class. Have you got any advice for Hannah there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me not surprise you by saying yes. I have some thoughts on this matter, right? So, um, it's, I tell you what's really interesting. I, I, I always try to be very alive to what it feels like to be a new teacher, and I think it's because I struggled a lot with my own teaching. For, I mean, for years, I mean, you know, for two or three years, I really, really struggled with behaviour management. I didn't get any behaviour management management advice that I thought was pretty useful. Certainly, none that stuck. And I, was, I felt very much thrown in at the deep end. I'm certainly not blaming my instructors or my school for that, but that's just the way it was. And I remember how difficult it was. When you are a PGC student and you are, you are basically an annex to the existing teacher, it's, which is a good circumstance to be in. It's good to have your, 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 your own training scaffolded by somebody else. But you can sometimes feel like you know, there's training wheels. And then there's this feel of this fear of what it'll be like when the training wheels come off. It's a bit like being a novice driver and suddenly realizing you have to go into a motorway for the first time. <laughs> you know, it just it seems like the scariest thing in the world. Um, but then most things do when you haven't done them before. I used to think that standing in front of a class would be scary, but in, until eventually you know, get to the point where, you know, how was I ever scared of this? I used to think that teacher training was scary. You know, standing standing in front of a room of your peers is very difficult. Yeah. But, you know, if you've done it often enough, it becomes just another thing that you do, just another day at the office. I'll be absolutely honest, up until the beginning of lockdown, I hadn't done a lot of webinar training. I mean, I've done a few bits of, you know, bits of, uh, you know, STEM work with yourself and Matt. Um, but I was, you know, I did that two or three times a year. What I hadn't done is lots of whole school training. And since the last 10 weeks, I must have done it about, you know, 25 times. And I was actually quite nervous of how I would come across with my bookshelf behind me and, you know, without my, 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 my props to be able to walk about. So everything feels weird and difficult and strange until you've done it for a while. So that's a perfectly natural thing. And it's just something you have to endure when you get your own, when you finally get your own class, um, you're going to be like a new doctor who goes on the ward after four years of medical school. And the nurse says, doctor, what do you think we should do? And the new doctor says, you know, what doctor, which one are you looking for? A lot of my friends used to say that when they became doctors, you know, who me? Uh, and a lot of teachers feel like that. But you'll get past that very, very quickly. Set your expectations the minute you meet them. The minute you meet them, do not, do not let them play guessing games. Behaviour is not the type of thing you want them to independently guess for themselves. You don't want them thinking, I wonder what she wants us to do. Be utterly explicit and be explicit about things that you think are bone shakingly obvious. They are not obvious to some people. You know, if you if you see I need you to enter the classroom in, in perfect silence, for example, you know, let's say that's one of your standards, I don't know if it is or not. But if it was, then why would you expect a child to know that if if they haven't met you before? They might think it's okay to walk in chatting at low level. And, you know, or, or maybe that is your expectation. Maybe I only want you to walk into the classroom no more than low level chat. Or I want you to line up beforehand. Or I want you to come straight in. Or I want you to get stuck, with, stuck in with the work. Or I want you to get a book from the book pile or self-register on the, on, the, on the Velcro wall or whatever. But whatever you want them to do, you've got to tell them what you want them to do. So set the expectations right at the beginning. And don't just get them to stick it in their books. As I keep saying this, teach it, don't tell it. There's, there's no good saying, you know, these are my behaviour rules. Good luck. I mean, you might as well have not told them. So it's, I normally, um, in a secondary context, I would normally dedicate at least my whole first lesson to behavioural expectations. And by behaviour, I don't just mean sitting still and shutting up. Although I don't not mean that. I also mean when I want them to talk, how I want them to talk, what lateness means, what I'll do if they're late, how I'll help them get their home... How will help them if their homework can't be handed in on time? Little things like that. So they know there's a behavioural framework to the classroom, to the lesson. And I, I wouldn't even introduce curricular topics until right at the end of the first lesson or even perhaps even the second lesson. Where I designing, and I have done, behavioural uh, instructional systems for schools, I would, um, I would try to make sure that um, students uh, you know, get 
this through, through their entire first week of, of, of instruction. Um, rather than simply making it something I tell them in five minutes. You know, if, I, if I'm dealing with a, a primary student uh, in, in, in a primary setting, I would probably use the whole day to go through lots of different procedures. And this is how we go to assembly hall and this is how we go to um, to, 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 to lunch and so on. And so that it secures that understanding for them. But basically front load it as much as you possibly can. Thanks, Tom. Um, we, we, we've got, I think we've got time for one last question, Go for um, it. and this is all around um, managing isolation. There might be different terms for it within different schools, and it's from Deborah. Uh, any tips when working with a range of all age students who are isolated for all different reasons within one classroom? Any ideas of involving all students to participate in um, engagement on the whole group? Yeah, that's that's very much a lockdown question, isn't it? And you know, we've we've certainly seen this type of thing happening more and more in the recent context. Um, it's funny because we do have a precedent for this because um, there's lots lots of schools that do, for instance, vertical tutoring or vertical learning. There's lots of schools, for instance, in rural environments or remote environments where you have to collapse the year groups down and, and, and kind of what do you do then? It, it becomes a wee bit more complex than, than, than standard teaching. I don't know if you've seen, there's a wonderful French film about teaching called Etre et Avoir, forgive my terrible accent, to, you know, to do and to be. And it's about a school exactly like this, where there's students from different circumstances and backgrounds. Now, obviously, you know, you can't teach the same lesson to 15 children from five different year groups. Um, because you know you can't do phonetic blending with children who are you know <laughs> seven years above that in terms of their, their literacy and whatnot. What you can do there's, there's several things. You can differentiate by outcome, which you know, um, which when I was trained to be a teacher was was always the, the great evil, the great sin. You mustn't differentiate by outcome. There's nothing wrong with differentiating by outcome if it's if it's for a specific task. You can give them all to do something that they can all achieve differently. You know, I mean, a classic example would be, you know, paint this rock <laughs> or, or something more interesting, possibly. You know, a 15-year-old could do something interesting with that and a five-year-old might just do, you know, a big grey blob or whatever. So there's certainly that. You might want to then create behavioural structures whereby the older children help to coach the younger children. And that can often be quite a valuable experience. It's very difficult to achieve, though, because you're expecting expertise from children that may not have it just because they're a wee bit older. So that's that's possible, but sometimes uh, problematic. You can show them a piece of text or a piece of script and then get them to respond to it in a way that's appropriate, for instance, writing about it in a way which is appropriate to, to their age level. You can do a topic which is thematically quite broad. For instance, you might be doing something like, you know, weather or rainfall and then give different resources to different children and then get them all to present at the end. Um, so that they've, 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 they've worked through their work at their own pace and their own rate, but they've come together as a group. I would, what I would definitely suggest to teachers in these types of circumstances is nobody's expecting it to be perfect. You do the best you can. I think that's something I would say over and over and over again to all teachers through lockdown circumstances, that we are going through a crisis. And we're still in, to some extent, a, you know, a, bit of a, a bit of a crisis. You know, we're, we ain't out of the woods yet. And... It's one of the reasons why I was so relieved to hear Ofted saying we're backing off for a while because they've completely accepted that there's no way you can judge schools in any rational same sense. I've heard crazy stories about schools um, doing lesson observations on teachers, you know, within the first few weeks of Zoom lessons when people are still trying to work out for themselves what the best things to do are. I think we all need to cut each other a lot of slack in these types of circumstances. If we can keep children safe, if we can keep them happy and working towards some educational aim, we can worry about improving it as we go along. But don't expect too much of yourself in the immediate outset. I'm thinking after having done it now for two months, we can now start thinking about improving and honing and so on. But we've never had to do this before. So let's not be too hard on ourselves. Brilliant. Thank, thank you, Tom. Um, uh, Thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed all of those. those no, answers. you always say um, that. You say that to all the consultants. <laughs> no, I really did, and um, I hope all the people who um, posed the questions got as much out of it as I did. Um, I certainly oh, lot, learned a lot from that discussion there. Um, so thank you, thank you very much for your My time pleasure. again. My pleasure. Good luck to everyone.